All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Lyde, and I'm the director, animator, and creator of the VR film Four Stories. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working on some great, cool projects over the last few years, uh, including Tales from Soda Island with Studio Syro, and recently announced Namu. But before any of that, there was Four Stories. So, Four Stories, um, hopefully most of you in here have already watched it, but if you haven't, uh, you won't get spoiled. Well, maybe you'll get a little bit spoiled, but it's not really a spoilable story. Um, so it's a wacky tale that takes place around a skyscraper, and it's meant to be watched many times. So, um, basically it's a short film. It's only about three minutes long, but what makes it special is that there are four stories happening simultaneously around the viewer, or not so much around the viewer, but more around a corner in front of the viewer. So if you're watching the blue story, you can take a few steps to the left and you can start watching the yellow story. And then if something in the yellow story uh, loses your interest, you can take a few more steps and you can watch the red story. And you can also just change viewpoints in Quill to kind of experience different angles on the same story. So that's kind of the concept. Um, and when I made the film, I wanted to, I wanted to take advantage of VR by allowing people to explore a space um, in ways that you don't find a lot in the co theater or even in VR films. A lot of them are more of a curated watching experience. So I really wanted to uh, to play with that exploration because I think that's one of the things that makes VR so fun. Um, and then also. As I was working on it, one of the goals was to make sure all the stories would synchronize. I wanted to make sure elements from the stories would intertwine and create a really rich um, viewing experience that was really suited to VR. Um, Four Stories is not a film that you can watch in 2D. It doesn't really work. Um, some VR experiences you can make 2D edits, but Four Stories would be very difficult because so many different things happen simultaneously. You can't really watch it even in VR in one sitting. You kind of have to watch it multiple times, otherwise you're going to lose lots of details that are happening in areas that you you just can't see simultaneously. Um, and yeah, making it in Quill was, was one of the main objectives and something I really strive for. Um, so going into the project, so if, if we go back a few years, I was really a rookie when I started. Uh, I started this project out of uh, school, basically. So I'd made a short film. I'd, I'd kind of known the process of making a short film. But doing it in Quill was uh, different, especially at the time. This, this Four Stories, uh, even though it released recently, was really made a couple years ago. It's, it's kind of been around for a while. And as hardware has changed, uh, it just took a little while to catch up. So... It was actually the first Quill VR film that was made, or and it was actually created a little bit earlier even than The Remedy, uh, but just because of scheduling it came out later. And that means when it came out, Quill, um, at the time there was no metric, there was nothing to look at to say, how do you make a Quill project of this scale? Uh, and it was even just a three minute project, but at the time three minutes was longer than your average looping quill piece you'd see in the, well, not in the quill theater, but just shared in the community even, or on Facebook spaces. It was all little loops. So three minutes, I was even wondering, can quill handle a three minute animated short? Nobody had tried it. Um, and then just making the film, thinking not specifically to quill, but how do you plan a film that has four stories happening simultaneously? How does that really work? Uh, and as I was saying, old quill means no transform keys. Uh, it didn't even have straight line snapping. Uh, so the first versions of the building I made were, I mean, they, they were freehand with the line tool, but you couldn't snap them to like axes, which made it very hard to build uh, geometric shapes. Uh, and even the timeline, um, I did have access to an early version of the timeline for the film, but it was very early version of the timeline. So there was... The UI is a little bit different than it is now, and it was brand new, so there was lots of bugs. So that was an interesting challenge. Um, and then also just wondering, 
I know how long it takes to make a quill project that's like a loop. It takes not long at all, but how does, long does it take to make a three minute film? I had just finished making a two minute film at school and that had taken like a whole year. So I knew Quill was fast, but finding out how fast I could work on four stories was eye-opening. Uh, the entire project, or at least all the animation portion of it, was done over the course of about two to three months. It was quite quick. Um, and finding out pipelines is something I had to do, I had to find out new, basically. Um, so on four stories, I, I wore a lot of hats. So I came up with it, I directed it, animated it, and I planned it. But it wasn't a one-man act. Uh, I also worked with a story assistant and a storyboard artist, uh, Marty Martin, who I'd known from college. So they helped me with all the story planning and really helped facilitate the project. They were essentially a uh, story assistant for me, and uh, it was very helpful to have uh, another person looking at the story and helping plan out all the details because it did get pretty complicated with those four simultaneous things. But then also, I had the Facebook audio team, who, led by Paul Gorman, and they were fantastic. They recorded sounds, music, and did the voice acting for the film. Uh, they also implemented the audio directly into Quill, which was super useful, because I had no real experience uh, working with audio in Quill, not to the level that we had in Four Stories. Uh, and the audio in four stories is such a huge part of the experience with, I'll talk about audio a little bit later, but the, the, the crux of it is that in four stories, you don't want to be able to hear all the audio at the same time from different angles because it doesn't take place 360. It takes place kind of in front of you and around a corner. So you wanted to make sure you couldn't hear around those corners until you move there. Um, but yeah, then also... There were the producers who helped keep the project on track. They would do check-ins and make sure everything was was on schedule and running well, and that was that was phenomenal. And last but not least, we had the uh, hardworking Quill developers who, at the time especially, it was the very early version of the timeline, so they had been taking my feedback and been implementing things and fixing various bugs that had come up in the Quill project. So. Uh, yeah, they really helped get that thing running. So now I'm going to talk about the characters. So the characters in Four Stories were basically fish alien inspired characters. And one of the main goals was to color code them to make sure people could keep track. And the characters, their very, very first version of the characters actually came from a another quill piece I had done called Jimfish. And at the time, the Four Stories really began at this project. And at the time, it was not called Four Stories. And this scene had nothing to do with the what later became Four Stories. Um, these characters were made just as fun, cartoony, animated characters. I had no plans of ever making an intertwining story set around an apartment building, uh, but the multicolored characters I made for this project ended up serving the purpose of the character designs for four stories in the future. So uh, these were kind of version one of the characters. I feel like I feel like this was like one of the memorable moments for me, where you know this was one of the posts of yours that went fairly viral within the group, you know, gaining a lot of traction. Um, it's definitely one of those that I remember the most from the early days. Yeah, I think it's probably the quill piece of mine that's got the most traction ever. So I it <laughs> definitely, I owe a lot to this piece. I just made it on a whim. Uh, I had a lot of fun making it. And um, yeah, I was happy to kind of expand the story of this world by making four stories with these characters. Um, so it's a little bit weird. But this is how the characters are built uh, for four stories and for pretty much everything I make now in Quill. I build the characters with very easy to access arms, legs, uh, sometimes I split the torso into two, like here, the feet. And this lets me kind of quickly grab and move like a stop motion puppet. It's very similar to if I was going to use the transform keys to animate. 
I'd use a similar kind of skeleton, but even just for frame by frame, it's super useful being able to grab pieces without having to worry about um, like accidentally grabbing extra strokes or accidentally, um, you know, not clicking on a certain piece that is floating. So all my characters are made of pretty simple body parts. And then the head is where I put the most detail and attention to. Um, even in this case, the heads aren't, they're not super complicated, but they have more shading, they have more elements, and by creating heads that are more detailed, I'm able to easily pose them. So the head is where I'm able to use the grab tool to stretch them, to change the spatial expressions, to really have creative control. Uh, and the lips and four stories are just a single line for each each face, and it's just floating on top of the geometry of the head. So it's very easy to grab and distort those mouths uh, in a way that they were designed to be easy to work with, essentially. And this system was great. It allowed me to make tons of characters. And these characters, I mean, I was able to make characters for this film in just a few minutes. Um, I could just sometimes just take a character I'd already made I could change their color, uh, use the grab tool to make them taller, shorter, make their head wider. Um, it was very flexible of a system that I could use to quickly populate a little apartment world, and they were all very easy to animate. Um, and also, like I'd said before, something important was the color uh, coordination of the film. So making different apartments, in this case different colors, and having characters that were different colors in those apartments uh, served to kind of guide the viewer as things got more confusing, like where a certain character had come from, where they were going. Uh, it just made it, it just made it, made it great in that regard. Uh, for the environments, they were also color, co color coordinated, so there was blue, yellow, green, and red stories. So the props in those environments and the characters in those environments were matching and they were, you know, they were different colors just to guide the eye. Uh, there was quite a process too to build in the layouts of these sets. Um, here's a video I, I found of an old V1 of the apartment and this was just trying to figure out, let me make a loop. This was just trying to figure out how could I make the four story building really work. Uh, I know I want it to be kind of a square. I wanted every story to have kind of equal real estate, but I also wanted it to feel like like an apartment. I wanted it to feel there had to be enough space, there had to be enough room, so finding out the proper scale and everything was a challenge. And in this early version you can really see the struggle I had without that line snapping. So the lines, I mean this was a rough pass. It's not. I did get a better version of this than this is just a test, but without the line snapping, it equally used to be quite hard to build straight architecture. I have to say though, it looks pretty appealing. It has a nice, uh, it does have a nice, like, kind of falling apart, like shanty building feel, but that wasn't really what I was going for, but. Yeah, I think this is like the, the stack stuff that we're trying to simulate with traditional 3D. How can we make it more hand-drawn and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And this is like, it's kind of like a happy accident, I think, because you, you didn't have the snap tool, but I think this mm -hmm. is like so hard to do in traditional 3D, right? To mm -hmm. make everything like hand-drawn like this, like this really, truly looks like yeah. a 3D sketch, you know, it's really cool. To yeah, this. and this early version as well, um, this is back when Four Stories was also a four-story building, which was um, at one point the intention, but there was so many um, benefits to making it a taller building that I eventually made it taller. Mm. Um, and then also just building these sets, even at this version, which was early, I knew that I wanted, um, I wanted to keep it simple, even if the building wouldn't necessarily make sense. People were going to be living in kind of one room apartments, kind of like studio apartments. But when it came to decorating them, I wasn't picky about every apartment needs a bed, every apartment needs a fridge. They kind of, I kind of picked and chose two rooms for each person to have, even if they theoretically should hopefully have more than that, or they should have more furniture mm -hmm. at least. 
but it wasn't it, it i treated them a lot more like stages so yeah. um it wasn't important that they necessarily reflected reality um hold on how do i stop this video hold on i'm just having some Yeah, it's cool because you never question it. You never wonder, oh, where is where's the bedroom or where is the yeah. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't want people to think too much about where the bedroom was. It wasn't really an important part of the story. So, yeah, I, I yeah, the, them. the story keeps you entertained enough so you don't have to question anything and it's just really engaging. Yeah. Um, so like I was saying a second ago, um, at one point it was a four story building and I kind of experimented with what if it was a little bit taller? So what if it was like five, six stories? Um, and but then I was wondering where do I put all the side characters? So I knew I wanted to have, I always knew I wanted to have the four stories at the top, but then around the scene, I wanted to hide more characters. So it just looked like a moment happening that you could pay attention to. And that was very clear, but there would be other things in the environment for the viewer to explore. I think that's something that's really fun about VR and I wanted to give that sense of the environment really being alive with more characters. So on the left, I'd been thinking, okay, maybe the characters, uh, maybe they're in the buildings beside yours. Like maybe if you turn around, you'll see people brushing their teeth in like a skyscraper across the street. Or if you look down on the ground, maybe you'll see people like um, at a gas station or at one point there was going to be an art gallery across the street. Uh, I thought maybe I'll put people in there. And in the end, I went more for the right option where you have one building in front of you. It's very tall, which makes it more, more interesting. Like I think it makes it more exciting to have just a big monumental kind of skyscraper and having all the characters isolated to one place in front of you, uh, I think just made it a more easily digestible set um, it was fun playing with the verticality so if you wanted to see stuff on the bottom floor you could sit on the ground or you can like crouch um, you could walk around to the side and kind of look up and down but having keeping stuff away from behind you and really all in front of you just made it made it fun and easy to to explore so ended up going with the right option uh, it did cause some problems because having everything in front of you at the same time um, is not the best way all the time to make quill cool scenes because it can get a bit heavy for the the quest especially but we ended up or I ended up pulling through that uh, again just a, an image of the rooms uh, like I said they were treated like stages so they really were meant to look good from the front each room and the characters in those rooms uh, basically you had stage left and stage right and the action would happen in one place. So in some VR films, you follow characters as they, they kind of move beside you and behind you. In this film, the goal was really to keep it in front of you, kind of like, like a 2D film, but more like a stage play. And the idea that you can then check out a different stage by moving was, was kind of essential. So I made sure all the building, all the apartments were the same format, uh, the same kind of layout. They made it very easy to be able to follow different stories uh, and like kind of understand that the rooms were similar. I wanted them to be on par. Uh, and that similarity kind of falls apart in some of the lower behind like the extra characters stories. But for the actual main story, they're all the same layout. So they all have a balcony and they all have a window. And those windows and balconies were great entry points for characters and exit points for characters, which happens throughout the story. So you can watch a character go from one balcony to another, uh, and that gives you a reason to want to follow the story around the building. Um, and also these two buildings, if you look at this rightmost apartment, basically the apartment that would go here, the red one, it's just this apartment, but then flipped and then rotated. So 
the closet of the red story would would line up to the exit of this story and the exit for this story would basically line up with the closet of this one so they basically formed a perfect square and um, it was just a really clean layout that was easy to work with when it came to populating the apartments I started with a mood board so I looked up different inspiration for each apartment so the blue character was more of a geeky kind of sci-fi character so I found a lot of reference of kind of what does a what does a geek apartment look like? What does a messy room look like for that kind of apartment? Uh, what would somebody into space be into? I put computers and just I found great reference and I did that for all of the stories. So the red apartment was more sleek and modern while the old lady's apartment was just kind of old and uh, had a lot of older furniture, more decorative stuff, lots of details. Uh, and then the green apartment was more kind of hipster photography art student type vegan space yeah <laughs> and i i kind of went with the colors that kind of matched that and some of the i mean i found some actually great inspiration looking up people's sims builds because people in the sims often work with small spaces and they try to populate them um like to fit their characters a lot of the characters people make in the sims are very like one note characters and they want to just create them spaces so i found people in the sims community make really good come up with really good ideas of how to populate those kind of spaces so it was a good inspiration uh then i modeled a bunch of props in a void before setting them up in their rooms so it was a little bit cramped in the apartments because uh all the walls were making it just a bit tight so i did build all the props uh, basically separate and then later on I combine them together into the actual um, layout. I also question, made some... Nick, question Nick, yeah. I just saw a CRT monitor. Did you ever use one? <laughs> uh, if you're life? talking about this one here... Um... No, no, I bought them right. Oh bottom yeah, right. I, I used to have one of these. Um, oh you do? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I had one of these when I was growing up. Um, and I don't have one anymore, obviously. Yeah, I was wondering if you're like the generation that, you know, only know flat screen. So I was like curious. No, the CRT. I had these. I didn't have, didn't have these. <laughs> I don't think I, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> um, well, but then there was also just within this film, uh, I just, uh, he was a kind of a PC user or Linux or something. And then up here, the lady in the green apartment actually has kind of a MacBook or something, or not a MacBook, yes. but a, whatever you call uh, them. Um, iMac. Yeah, an iMac. Uh, and then the old lady had this one. So there was like mm -hmm. a TV screen in just about every apartment. And it was one way that was a good way to kind of separate the different aesthetics and different generations of the different characters, I think, in the story. So just little background details. Um, and there was also some posters. Uh, I don't think these posters made it into the final film. But at one point I wanted to put lots of posters in the room of the blue character specifically. Uh, so these three on the left I designed in Quill. And I took a picture of them because I wanted to match the style. And then I put them up on the wall. And the two on the right were done by Marty. And they were just, um, just fun little posters that could go up in this universe. But the reason they were cut was really a performance thing. Uh, and also just visuals. I think they they kind of looked jarring. Even the ones that were made in Quill didn't quite fit in. They were more detailed than everything around them uh, in most cases. And then the uh, other reason was just every single image in the scene was taking up a draw call. And I didn't want to make mm -hmm. the wall one image necessarily because it, it had its own other problems like the edges and stuff. So in the end, I decided uh, no posters. It I think I put posters, but they're just like rectangles on the wall. They're not... Um, they're very, very simple, so hmm. scaled back. But it is an approach that works if you if you want to put posters in your film, but this one wasn't right. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the story, how I kind of planned out a complicated story and how I, I did storyboards and everything. So uh, for the story, I used a free website... Um, I use a free website called Poplet to create a story web for the project. The story was divided into four acts, or three acts and a looping intro, to be more accurate. Um, act one, well, the looping intro was where 
it's what it sounds like. The characters before the story begins is just, um, you know, he's uh, he's using a telescope. She's uh, sleeping, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then Act 1 was kind of establishing uh, the story. Like, what do they do that kind of triggers events to start happening? Act 2 was those events kind of culminating and kind of intersecting with each other. And then Act 3 was the rooftop where the uh, story kind of wrapped up. Um, so doing it like this really helped keep things organized. It helped, I think, when it comes to audio because you had a moment where the audio could get more intense in the middle for all the stories uh, and moments at the beginning where it'd be a little bit more calm and then Act 3 where they're all together, which is the most uh, simple area of the story because everything happens together instead of in different areas around the film. So... Um, if you get in closer, you can see some examples like um, the alien begins to eat stuff and grow bigger. Uh, maybe he feeds it, just coming up with ideas. And then I drew, made a poplet go, the alien escapes out the window, and then that connects over to alien appears on the kid's balcony. So I was able to plan out uh, the story to find out where the things would connect, like here and here, and how that would kind of work together. Uh, which was super useful. And there were some notes that didn't make it in. Like, I would have liked to have an apartment-wide power outage for a few seconds at some point. Maybe the alien would have bitten down on a wire or something. And then everybody would react to the same thing. But some of those ideas mm -hmm. didn't make it in. Um, would have been complicated and I couldn't figure out the best way to do it. I think the main thing was I didn't want everything to happen because of the alien. Um, and then finding a time for that to happen while everything else was happening was just tricky. Hmm. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, yeah. But in the one thing that kind of helped the story uh, or helped plan it easier was that there was really two stories that were influencer stories that would kind of cause things to happen in the apartment <clears throat> and two stories that were kind of taking those influences and their stories were changing because of them. So the alien arriving... Uh, that alien started traveling through the apartment and that caused chaos in the other stories. And in the burglar story, the burglar started traveling around and that caused chaos throughout the stories. So the red the red story with the kid and his mother and the green story with the girl at her computer were more passive and um, it helped not having everybody influencing everybody. It kept things a bit more focused. Mm. So once I had um, all of the acts or all the all the story beats kind of planned out that's when marty uh did some beat boards for the story so these were super useful for me and served almost as concept art for some of these moments um so pretty much every <laughs> moment of the film was was boarded out not everything here made it most of it did um for instance i don't think the old lady hits him with her uh, diamond anymore. That was something that didn't quite make sense when I tried to make it's it work. Pose. It's a great pose, yeah. Um, yeah, Marty's a great starboard artist who really uh, helped with getting the everything working. Uh, this also mm -hmm. helped a lot because uh, at the time that we started, the quill models were not posed. They weren't animated yet. So seeing them in expressive poses and with their expressive faces had me rework the faces a little bit so that they could make some of these poses better. Um, and it just, it kind of helped take the project to a new, a new level as far as the poses and um, expressions and everything went. So very useful to have this as a, as a guide. Um, when it came to story guides, there was also um, like, these were something I made, which, I mean, it just looks like the apartment, which it is. But they actually served as reference points for the storyboards. So using those reference points, um, when we got to our storyboards, uh, Marty was able to just take those screenshots from Quill and basically do draw overs. So, mm -hmm. so we'd always be able to know where the character is uh, at every moment of the film. So the most useful so, one was the front-facing one, just because that's kind of the stage uh, layout. I tried hmm. to even look up how do how do stage how do theater performances um, storyboard. I figured 
they must have a storyboarding process. I couldn't find anything on it, honestly, so I just came up with this. I'm like, I feel, feel like this is probably a, a good way to do it. So it worked really well. Uh, it was very clear for me working to know where the character should be at, at, at any given moment, uh, how far they had to go, and yeah, it was it was very useful. Uh, I have a animatic. Right. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just have a question about the storyboard. Yeah. With Quill being so, you know, you can do quick sketching in, in there, um, how did it help to do 2D storyboards rather than just do it really quickly in, in Quill? I think there would have been, um, I think we would have had some efficiency if we did it in Quill. The reason we didn't was mainly because we were on a pretty limited timeline for the project. And my storyboard artist had never used Quill, didn't own a computer that could run a Quill, didn't have a VR headset. So the pro the time it would have probably taken to get them a headset and teach them how to use a new software would have maybe taken more time than them using the skills they already had um, and making them like this. I do think... You have to think about that. Um, Nick was testing like an early prototype of the animation tool, so it was not as... Mm -hmm. refined and powerful that it is now so maybe now you might do something different nick but um yeah it was like i think there was a lot of aspects that led to this decision right yes um that's true as well is that the the timeline was was very rudimentary it was still a little bit buggy it wasn't really i feel like i could have storyboarded with it but um i was focusing on preparing other things for the project so i didn't have time to storyboard while also doing the animation pass, so I wanted to offhand that, so um, it worked out, but like you said, I think there is, I think you, you would have good success if you were to do it nowadays directly into Quill. I think it would be a, a good approach, but this mm. method worked because the film was not a 360 experience, but you could split it up into four basically films that took place on like a limited set. It made it pretty easy to, to plan like this. Um, and here's just a uh, animatic. I'll just let it play. Of basically the first uh, first animatic of the film. If you've looked at the behind the scenes for four stories, you'll recognize this because I, I used it as a frame by frame. But this was a great way to get a sense of the timing for all these moments and uh, kind of how they play together. So there were four of these, one for each each story, and one actually five of these. One for each story, and there was one for the roof, because the roof sequence was kind of its own different act that didn't need to be separated like this. <clears throat> um, but yeah, so I love storyboards, and uh, these were great for the project. They, they helped me figure out poses, and they helped me figure out timing, and yeah, it was super useful tool. Also, for everyone who's watching and um, don't want to interrupt while Nick is talking, feel free to write your questions in the stream chat, and I will read them to Nick um, after he's done with the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'll let this... Hopefully, can get back to my presentation this time. Nope. Okay. <laughs> I think the reason is because I made, I made these videos huge on my slideshow. Like, they'd basically take up the entire <laughs> screen. Um, Oh, wait. Oh, okay, we got there. So, um, yeah, I mean, that, that's about it for story and storyboards. That's kind of how it went. Um, animation is a big area that I had to focus on with the new timeline, and it was fun to kind of figure out how that timeline worked uh, in longer form stories. So, like I'd said before, the storyboards were really helpful uh, for many reasons. One of those reasons was figuring out Good key poses for these characters to do throughout the story. Um, if anybody is new to Quill, you now have transform keys, but at the time the characters were not transform keyed, and there's not a single transform key in the project. It's all frame by frame. So I took a very 2D animation approach by doing key poses first, and then going in to do in betweens once the timing was figured out. Basically, this, this blocky look you see here was how the whole film was laid out originally. Every story, you could watch it in a, in a way that you'd see one pose every 
couple seconds or something. And this was super useful to make sure all the stories were lining up properly and kind of get a very basic, uh, basic layout of the timing. Mm. Uh, because the problem was that if I changed the timing on anything in the film, I would yeah. have to then go to every one of the other stories and move all the frames over for every story because, you know, if he takes two more frames to sit down, that means the part where he goes outside then happens two frames later. And so the part where he meets up with somebody, yeah. everything gets trickled down. So it was kind of complicated, mm -hmm. but starting as simple as we could really helped. If we'd done lots of frames, it would have been even more complicated. But once the timing was basically settled in, uh, I started to do the in-betweens. So, so actually there's um, a question from Alex and that directly relates to what you just said. Sure. He asked, how did you polish the timing of each story? Did you use one story as a guide to know how long the other should be? Or did you work on all of them simultaneously after planning them with your animatic? Uh, we did them kind of simultaneously. Um, I think I would say that the blue story and the yellow story were basically the ones, like I said, that kind of pushed everything along. The blue story was kind of the priority one. So what happened in the blue story, I would say influenced everything else, but we also made sure the yellow story worked. Um, it was a lot of back and forth, um, but the red story and the green story were really kind of at the whims of the other stories that were pushing things. So yellow and I, I guess blue and yellow were the ones that were, were the ones that I did have to build in tandem, but the other ones kind of fell in suit basically. So there was more moments in the red story that just didn't make it because the timing didn't really work out with the other stories coming in. Uh, there was a part where the mother came in and kind of walked over and she checked the closet for monsters and there was nothing there. Uh, but the problem was that the amount of time it would have taken her to walk to the other side of the room and check a closet just was eating up too much time that we just couldn't really afford because the timing would have been off for everything else. So, hmm. um, Interesting. yeah, it was hard to fit some moments in, but we, the blue story and the yellow story were the most, they were, they were pretty much locked. Uh, awesome. and then just, uh, final kind of animation, just one frame, uh, with all the frames and no onion skin showing. Uh, and this is just another animation. Um, the animation for the whole film was basically done with this approach. There was a straight ahead for some of it where we would just kind of, or where I would just kind of animate pose, pose, pose. It wasn't always pose to pose. It wasn't always mm -hmm. keyframes, especially for like walks mm -hmm. and runs because it gets a little bit... Um, bit did, you, um, did you frame by frame, like a straight ahead, like for example, the body first and then later straight ahead the arms and then later straight ahead the feet? Like in, in different passes or just the whole body? Uh, um, it's been together. I don't remember. I think mostly it was all together. Uh, this particular yeah. example, maybe it looks like we did it separately because the head, uh, yeah. you can maybe see in the first few poses, the head's not there. This was actually, this was taken from the new Quest version. Uh, and yeah. in that version, at one point when I was optimizing, I thought maybe I will have to remake the head low poly and then reanimate the head for the whole film because the heads are stupid high poly in this film like for what they needed to be like i could basically the head was like say thirty thousand polys or whatever and which isn't that bad but the head could have been like five thousand polys like it's not that much mm -hmm. so i was like oh maybe i'll have to reanimate the head frame by frame so the first half or so of the blue story i did do that um but then i got I was like, I don't want to redo all of these stories. There's so many frames. <laughs> um, something that was kind of tricky and probably not something I would do again was the the timeline for these for these characters were kind of weird because they were basically one long track because there was not really any cuts. So the blue character would have a timeline that basically was three minutes long with all the mm. frames in it. And... I would be able to make a cut when he, say, went out the door or something. Uh, but for the most part, it was all just one long timeline. So anything we, anytime we moved a frame, everything would shift. And it was pretty tricky. Mm. Um, something else I did, which is kind of an old quill technique that you wouldn't really do now, 
or you could do now, but I wouldn't really recommend, was I actually made, I animated the entire project uh, on 12 frames per second. And then later on, I moved it to 24, and then I used that double keyframe button to basically mm -hmm. match the timing, but then it would be on 24. It was just easier to move frame by frame through all the poses when they were all kind of, um, like when, when I was at one frame would take me to where I needed to go instead of putting everything on twos. Um, and the reason it was kind of possible to do it with that workflow was because at this point, the quill timeline still had different frame rates for different layers. Yeah. Which was, which is like an old quill, uh, method where you could have a layer that's one frame per second. You could have one that's 90 and you could have one that's 24. And, um, so all the characters were at 12 and then I moved them to 24 later. Um, but I didn't have to move the whole scene to 24 essentially. So, but you could do that now, uh, if you plan for the whole project, but I don't think it's worth it. Um, but that's the yeah, reason why that the, the function is useful now to slow down certain animations. You mm -hmm. know, if you don't want to like, like if you want to put a hold between each frame, there's a button called times two. Um, and that is something I use sometimes to when I animate 24 frames per second and I notice mm -hmm. like, oh, the anim brush is actually moving too fast. And that's like a quick way to, um, half the speed by yeah. just adding a hold. Yeah, I actually, the reason it exists is because I, I requested it for this workflow, but I still find it useful for different workflows now. Like, um, I'll usually create a bunch of frames on once, and then I'm like, well, I need it to be longer, so I usually double it, and then I'll add a brush on those blank frames. But it just helps me get, instead of going frame by frame and putting it on two, on two, on two, it just it mm. speeds up my workflow, so... Um, yeah. It's a nice, it's a, it's a tool you wouldn't think would be as useful as it is. I have used it pretty often. Um, so then there's also, aside from the main characters, there's lots of extras in the story, which I had a lot of fun animating. Uh, the extras are, well, they're running very low frame rate because I think it's loading all these GIFs. But um, the extras were really fun because compared to the main characters in the story, which were super long full track animations that ran from frame zero to frame like like 3000 these were <laughs> like 10 frame loops and they were very um very fun and simple to make um when it came to it's like a relevant question here from kurt yeah. he was asking was it an image sequence on the green characters monitor um i don't know where animation? you saw the green characters monitor but it was actually just a made up fake facebook messenger but it was it was quill strokes um let me see if i can go back and find this well the bottom right monitor from one of the side characters is also all quill strokes right uh the one here where you see the like the news anchor the news cast yeah yeah it's quill strokes nice just flat quill strokes um and animated like a character so just little bump, bump up and down and i did i'd done like a lip sync for the guy even um this animation used to be a little bit more complex than it is now. Uh, this is one of the areas I had to scale back when it came to going onto Quest because I had to make all these image, all these animations the same frame range so that they could happen on one merged layer. Um, mm. So they were <clears throat> reanimated at some point. I think the, the guy at the top left is an exception because his animation was too cool to, um, <coughs> to like merge with these short loops, but... Uh, for the most part, they ended up merged, which mm. is better for um, <coughs> which is better for the the film. Um, so I'm gonna talk about audio. Uh, the audio for four stories is actually super impressive and really different than your average VR piece. Um, this section is gonna be kind of short because I didn't um, didn't do the audio, uh, the audio team did, and I don't wanna speak wrongly about exactly what they did, but I, I know a little bit about it, so. Uh, Paul and the audio team made it pretty easy to work with them, and um, the audio basically, uh, the audio basically follows the animations, but doesn't line up specifically with every story beat because it's the same song that plays across all four. Um, but it works really well with the different acts. Um, 
there's a f audio mode or an audio setting for layers called Frustum, and this is one that we use a lot for the film because it's kind of a, a cube that kind of shoots outwards. So it worked really well with the size of the, like the, the shape of the apartment, essentially. Um, and the, what's cool about Four Stories Audio is that you basically don't want to hear, if you're looking at a story on one side of the building, you don't want to hear the story, the story from the other side. So the audio is spatialized in a way that if you turn a corner, you'll no longer hear the audio from the place you just left, essentially. Um, so yeah, you I can... think the magic happens that, you know, like it just works, right? You watch four stories and you don't even question that mm -hmm. challenge, you know? But if you would hear all the sounds at the same time, it would be a nightmare, right? Because then you wouldn't oh, yeah. even be able to hear anything anymore at that point. Yeah, because your standard kind of quill spatialized audio is kind of, it's like a spherical radius. So the audio comes out of like kind of a sphere shape. But that wasn't really efficient for the story because then you would easily if you leaned in close to hear one story you would hear the one behind the wall because it would come through so we needed one that could kind of shot out like this uh, and that was developed for four stories as well because we needed a new audio system so the developers and the audio team worked really well together to to get that stuff working uh, because quill doesn't have say culling or like a wall doesn't actually block sound it's just quill strokes so new system was was designed for that um this is a video that i'll just quickly scr scrub through this was just uh something i had given to the audio team that was just showing where where what audio i needed for each scene so these are just random things i took in quill i actually uh put four stories into maya which was a crazy thing to do um and i was able to get nice pans and stuff. Now with the camera tools, like it's so much easier than than it was with those old camera tools, but I wanted to get nice steady shots and pans and stuff. But basically the purpose of this was just to say why, um, what audio do I need for these scenes? There's the messenger. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, oh, look, it just glitched. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, it was not an image sequence. It was just cool strokes. <clears throat> uh, in the final version of Four Stories, I don't actually know if there's any images. I think it's all quill strokes. This story changed at some point. Well, there wasn't much going on here anyway. Um, but yeah, so that was just just something I gave to audio team, and just with that, they were able to make uh, they were basically able to do exactly what I needed. So last last uh, real section was getting it on the quest. So. I mean, it was a real challenge because this film was planned and basically completed before the quest was even announced. So I had never expected it to have to run on mobile. I guess in some ways I got pretty lucky um, that I didn't make a film that was so crazy it could never run on mobile. The characters could have been painted completely realistically. The environments could have had like... Or not. Yeah. The environments could have been crazy realistic, and it wouldn't have been like I don't know if it would have been possible, but because of the simple style I used for four stories, um, it actually worked out really well. Uh, so this is a video, just before it ran on quests, it ran on PC, <laughs> and before I could watch it in a th in a real environment, I oh had God, a backpack PC to test it with, and this kind of kind of proved to me it's like oh actually this works like it actually is really a nice experience to be able to walk around the apartment because we were worried that maybe nobody would ever get to see it this way without maybe going to a festival or something and you get a backpack but your average user would not be able to experience it in a way that lets you walk around uh just you know it just wouldn't happen so um oh my god oh Anyway, so getting on a quest was super high priority, and oh, but also shit. a super large challenge. So on the left is the uh, performance panel of four stories before optimization. So this is the one that would run fine on Rift, and this was designed before this panel existed. So 
it was like okay uh i don't i had no idea really of how bad it was gonna how bad it was um but it was pretty bad so the memory wasn't too bad it was only like a few hundred megabytes off which is not too bad uh the triangles as well not that high uh all things considered only drop a little bit um and basically fixing triangles would fix memory so not too worried but the draw calls uh was a very uh scary situation because it was 339 of the 65 it needed to be and it was read the whole way through so there was not a single second of the film that was ready to go on the quest <laughs> um <laughs> and the audio as well uh the audio channels are a new thing but that also was way too high so um I'm so, surprised at how like low the memory and poly numbers are. Like I think back then, like you already did an amazing job in like optimizing without even considering to put it mobile, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's really not that bad if you look at the numbers. Yeah, the numbers aren't bad, with the exception of the draw calls. Uh, those yeah. were very mm -hmm. high, but the I'm other numbers surprised. were pretty manageable. And as you can see, uh, I got them well below the threshold. So for for triangles especially. <clears throat> it's like yeah okay I, I maybe went overkill i got it to only 500 <laughs> it could have been twice that mm. but <laughs> but there was a reason for that too so um um basically the triangles uh was the, one of the first things i i kind of tackled uh well I, I tackled everything i guess i wanted to make sure it would be possible first uh to even get the draw calls low enough so i did some testing but um the triangles I got those lower by basically repainting every single object in the film, <laughs> which <laughs> just the simple task of repainting everything. Um, but it, it was really worth it because like you saw, they got down to only 500 of, they used to be uh, like almost 2 million. Um, but basically all I needed to do was repaint them with the line tool. So this TV, the only difference between these two models, aside from the color change a little bit on the right one, just from our, our direction, uh, was that I made it out of the line tool and I removed the back because you couldn't see it. And it went, it got literally like four times smaller. So I basically applied that same process to every prop in the film and the film became four times lighter. Um, which also brings up a good how was it drawn something, um, something that is not measured uh, which is like uh, the overdraws right mm -hmm. so you're avoiding by removing the back you're avoiding a bunch of overlapping strokes that also affect performance so that's, mm. that's yeah that was that was another reason i did this was it it worked on quest when it was like i could get it down to 1.2 million triangles uh but the problem was when i tested that on the quest uh it still ran terrible uh, partially just because there were so many strokes overlapping that I, I had worked, just worked messy because that was never something I thought about. And by repainting with the flat line tool, um, I was just able to remove how many brush strokes were actually in the scene. And um, yeah, because the edges of the building, if you think about it, you're looking through an, an apartment with a character in it full of props. And then behind that wall, there's another apartment full of characters and full of props. So because Quill doesn't, kind of that doesn't hide things that are behind walls um they were basically all rendering and it was making it very heavy so i tried to lower the triangles as low as i possibly could down to only kind of 500 so that there was just not that much geometry in the scene um and that kind of made up for the overdraw in some cases um but yeah if you ever want to find a way to make your scene lighter use a straight line tool it will really help and at this point I was able to make it with the snapping, which was nice because originally I had to make these without it. So it helped keep things a bit straighter. Um, this concept might be a little bit hard to explain, uh, but it's basically the way that I would remove the draw calls, which was the hardest bit, was I have a layer in the film that is just the, the objects that are not moving or Basically, any object in the film that's going to be moving, they're on one layer. So I've kind of, just to demonstrate in this video, like anything that's light is on the object moving object layer. Anything that's dark is kind of just static background. So this butterfly net is going to move. This um, telescope's going to move. The doors are going to move. He's going to leave these doors. This fridge door is going to open. 
these computers are going to get eaten, so they have to disappear at some point. So everything else doesn't ever move. Uh, the trap door at the top is going to fly off. So um, basically those are all on one layer. So it's just one draw call or a few draw calls for the entire, all the moving props. And then everything else is all on a layer. And it's not just these. Uh, you can see down here the chair. Any, any object that moves in the entire film for all four stories are on one like master layer. And then basically whenever something moves, it basically leaves the layer for a second. And then as soon as it stops moving again, it gets remerged with the um, with the other layer again. So mm -hmm. it's it's kind of uh, hard to visualize. It's a bit complicated complex, but um, it I really helps. I think the helps. best thing to do is you know um, go to the YouTube channel and check out um, um, Nick's optimization class that he gave because that's where he goes in depth about this technique yeah. how he um swaps layers and stuff moving layers and stuff. Exa layers. exactly go oh, there, there we go <laughs> there we go um yeah exactly I so <laughs> i was gonna say if you want to know how to do that in a scene that's like, four stories is a very complicated film there's so much going on but one of the very first things i talk about in this other video on optimizing complex scenes is that exact situation it's when you have a film where mm -hmm. objects basically start moving after they haven't been moving for a while or they one by one move and then kind of become static. Um, that's kind of the reason why the four stories draw calls were just so high because there were so many props around the story that got used at one point and then got kind of put down. So the main mm. thing is just finding ways to merge those all back together so that they're not always taking up all your memory. Um, so the only, I mean, that's basically the end. Um, here's a Man, picture of my mom so watching it timing. on the quest. Um, she doesn't know she's in this presentation, uh, but I really enjoyed <laughs> uh, watching her watch it because because it was on the quest. She was able to kind of she was able to sit down and like look at the stories that were lower uh, and like the side characters, and she really liked exploring and walking around the building. So this wouldn't have been possible uh, before it was kind of ported to quest. Um, she, she probably would never have worn a backpack BC. And if she'd been tethered to a computer, I don't think she would have wanted to walk around and she would have got tangled. So just being able to like crouch and walk side to side, like it just made the film very accessible. And I think it was definitely worth all the trouble to get it working. Uh, thank you. <laughs>